Hey everybody, and welcome to Pedal Powered Anthropology. Today, we're going to be talking about a topic that's pretty common in introductory level anthropology courses. And as you move up a bit, particularly in bioanth, or if you start taking medical anthropology courses, you're going to dig into it in much more detail because it's considered one of the most egregious abuses of medical ethics. And it's particularly relevant to today because it deals not only with systemic racism, but also a catastrophic failure of government-sponsored epidemiology. And seeing as how we've all got a bit of a background to build on at this point, it's an excellent case to look at to better understand the, understand the role that ethics play when researching human subjects. And it's a great way to start understanding the different play of power dynamics. And so, if you've taken introductory anthropology courses, or if you've taught introductory anthropology courses, you may very well have guessed that today we're going to be talking about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. In the 1920s, syphilis was a major health concern, and it affected about 35% of reproductive age individuals. Treatments were iffy. They involved things like mercury, arsenic, and bismuth, which, you know, did treat the condition to some extent, but they were equally as toxic to the individuals, so doctors were constantly weighing the harms of treatment against the quality of life of the patient. And oftentimes, treatments didn't cure. They only really lessened the symptoms. And after months of treatment, the side effects were often fatal. So naturally, there were plenty of studies that tried to find better treatments for conditions like syphilis. But with the onset of the Great Depression, funding for projects and treatment development was cut. And with funding drying up, doctors Talia Farrow clark and Raymond Fondolea decided that it would be a good idea to study untreated syphilis for six months in a population of African-American men to demonstrate the need for direct treatment programs, plus to, you know, compare to the progress of untreated syphilis in white individuals. And in 1932, the study began. There were 600 total individuals involved in the study, 399 of them had been diagnosed with syphilis, and 201 of them were not diagnosed with syphilis, and they were used as a control group. Men were given periodic treatments for quote-unquote bad blood, which was sort of a blanket colloquial term that uh, it wasn't a real diagnosis. It was used to include several diagnoses, including syphilis, anemia, and fatigue. From the outset, there were some pretty serious ethical issues with this study. First of all, the individuals with syphilis were never told of their diagnosis. They were just told they were being treated for bad blood. They were never told that they wouldn't receive actual treatment for syphilis, and they were never given any information about the prognosis of their condition, about how contagious it might be, or any congenital implications should they choose to have children. Throughout the early part of the 30s, several papers were published on the study, and they were roundly criticized because it was unknown if the subjects were even being treated. Later it would come out that the physicians involved were specifically asked not to treat the patients. It's at this point, in 1936, four years into a six-month study, that it was decided that the study would follow these individuals until death. And indeed, the study went on until 1972, 40 years longer than originally proposed. By 1928, Alexander Fleming had already discovered penicillin. By 1930, it had shown promise in treating a number of illnesses, and by 1940, it had been used widely and successfully, and there were already plans underway to start mass production. With the onset of World War II, Treatment for syphilis was ordered under the draft, but the subjects of the study were prevented from obtaining it. And by 1945, penicillin was the treatment of choice for syphilis and many other conditions. And for syphilis, one course of antibiotics was all that was required if the diagnosis was made early enough. By 1947, rapid syphilis treatment centers were established, but the men in this study were prevented from accessing them. They were told that they would lose their medical care. They were told that they would no longer get the free meals associated with participation in this study, and they were told they would lose the, the funeral benefits provided by this study. And beyond that, access to the existence of the syphilis treatment centers was actually suppressed 
by the people involved in running this study. In 1968, a social worker named Peter Buxton and several others blew the whistle on the study and the gross ethics violations committed by the people running it. In 1969, a year after the whistle was blown, the CDC stated that it needed to continue the study. But in 1972, it was publicly condemned and the study ended. But that's not where the story ends. In 1973, a class action lawsuit was filed on behalf of the victims and their families, and they were subsequently awarded $10 million in damages. On top of that, there were more restrictions imposed on all research involving human subjects. And that included things like requiring informed consent and accurate reporting of research methods and, and results. But really, the damage was done. No amount of financial compensation could recoup the human cost or buy back the lost trust. And to top it off, there was no official apology until 1997, when at a ceremony attended by five of the eight remaining survivors, President Bill Clinton apologized on behalf of the United States. But of the 299 syphilis-diagnosed men who participated in this study, 28 of them died from syphilis. An additional 100 of them died from complications related to syphilis. 40 of their wives contracted the disease, and 19 of their children were born with congenital syphilis. And none of it had to happen. Had the researchers simply taken into consideration studies published literally decades before they started their own, they would have maybe been a little less curious about the potential for unique physiological aspects in, in African American men. Had they simply disclosed an accurate diagnosis to the men involved, they could have gone on to make informed choices regarding their own health care and family planning. Had the men in the study not been actively dissuaded or even prevented from seeking treatment, they could have lived much more comfortable lives, even in the years before a cure. And had the study not continued for literally 80 times longer than initially proposed, every single person could have been treated with penicillin and cured.